Hi, I'm Chris from CodeReviewVideos.com and in this video we're continuing on with our Symphony 4 contact form implementation. So you may be wondering why, even though we've used Bootstrap largely for the styling, each of these form fields just looks like it's got no styling at all. Well, fortunately Symphony can help us here, but it doesn't do by default. There are a couple of ways that we can enable Bootstrap 4 theming for our form inside our Symphony project. So we can either enable a Bootstrap 4 form theme for a particular template, or we can enable Bootstrap 4 form theming for our entire project. Now the Bootstrap 4 theme was a new feature added in Symphony 3.4, and it's always worth actually keeping an eye on the Symphony blog, as new and cool stuff is added to Symphony all the time. And aside from following the GitHub issues register, it's often the first place that you'll hear about new features. Okay, so I'm going to enable Bootstrap for form theming for my entire project. I've never had a situation where I only want form theming for a single form. So I'm leaning towards my personal experience here, but change it up as you see fit. So what we need to do is look under config, under packages, we need to find twig, and we need to define a new bit of config in here, a new key called form themes, themes being plural, this can be an array, and I'm gonna set up the bootstrap underscore four horizontal layout.html.twig. You can look at the show notes for the variations, choose the one that you prefer. That should be enough if we refresh. Okay, that looks okay. There is a bit of an issue because we've manually added in our button, it doesn't get the styles, whereas if as I showed in the previous video, we'd added that submit type to our contact type, that would be nicely styled. So we will have to do some manual styling just for the button. The other thing is we're getting these translation errors. Now I have no need for translation in this project. So I'm gonna do the easiest thing and just turn them off. Kind of looks like you might want to go under translation, but you actually want to go under framework. Just add a new key in here called translator. And we'll just set that to be enabled as false. Okay, let's quickly refresh and the way that error goes. So it might be nice to style up this button. So back inside, well, we'll just get rid of some of these to begin with. Back inside our contact HTML twig, we can start by adding in a class just like normal, button, button success. These are just bootstrap things. Give that a refresh. We've got some nice looking style at least. But in order to get our button aligned, well, I mean, firstly, you may not actually care about things like that but I do, so I'm gonna try and make this look that little bit nicer. Let's see if we can't get rid of some of these things. I'd like this to be on the side, so we'll dock it to that side. Pull that out just a touch. Come on, you silly thing. I don't want that to be in responsive mode. Oh, I think it's that, actually. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'd like my button to be aligned similarly to this. And what that means is I need to replicate the same HTML structure. So I'm just going to edit as HTML, take a full copy of that. And all I want to do, just to quickly illustrate what I'm, what I'm talking about, is this is the entire form group, the form row. And we've got this label, which is taking up two columns. And the rest fits into this 10 column area. So Bootstrap's grid being split over 12 columns, two columns for the label, 10 columns for the content. My theory is, as long as I'm in the 10 column area and the two column area is blank, my button should align quite nicely. Okay, so let's paste that in. See if we can't get this to tidy itself up a bit. Mm, not really. You know, it's probably quicker just to redefine this. So I'll just do a div with a class of col small two. Just be an empty div. Duplicate it, set it to 10. This one won't be an empty div. This one will contain my button. Take that button, pop it in there, tidy that up a touch, bring that back up and drop that in there. See where we get. Et voila. Okay, so visually we're about where we need to be, but if we fill in this form, and even if we fill it in so that it looks approximately okay, then when we submit, not a great deal happens. Well, actually some stuff does happen, but it's not that immediately obvious as to what. If you just jumped in, you may not be aware that if we try and submit, for example, like this, then it's going to pop up with some validations. And if we try and submit like that, then it's gonna say, okay, I understand that this actually is an email field and you're trying to submit something that doesn't look like an email. And we've covered why this is okay. It's HTML5 validation. It happens on the front end, but it can't be trusted to be 100% accurate for the back end. 
Now we will get onto validation, which is something Symphony is extremely good at, but we'll get onto that in the next series. What we now need to do is tell Symphony how to handle our form submission. In order to do this, we're gonna to need to add some more code to our contact controller. So in order to understand if data has been submitted, we're going to need to look at the request. If we're going to need to look at the request, we need to inject it. Make sure to inject it from HTTP foundation. Okay, now we have the request, let's do something with it. The first thing that we need to do is call form handle request, passing in that request object. Now this request object is going to be injected whether we're loading the page for the first time. So it's just as though we've come along, hit that, and that's we've loaded up for the first time. We're still getting access to that request. And in fact, we can validate this ourselves by dumping the request and then refreshing the page. So even though we're not submitted anything, we refresh and we can see on the web debug toolbar, we can get access to that request. There's just nothing in it. So if we was to go into the request request, there's nothing there. Okay, so now let's fill in some nonsense, but make it look like valid nonsense and send this in. Take another look at the request, at the request. Now we've got these parameters, which is our contact form, which contains all our form data. And that's because we have posted the form in, so the request object is correctly populated, but still we're not doing anything with it. Jumping back into the controller, when we call form handle request, well, let's look at what that actually does. As you can see from the interface, it inspects the given request and calls the submit function if the form was submitted. Now it may very well be that this is the first time that you've ever come across the concept of an interface. And if so, you might be wondering where the implementation is. So like you can see the public function handle request, but where's the, the actual code that's going to get run when this method is called. Now I'm not gonna go into interfaces specifically, but you'll see that a lot of Symfony code relies on interfaces. It's actually a good program in practice. And as I say, it's a different topic, which I have videos on on the site already. So as a little tip, if you ever see an interface like this, the first thing that I'd recommend that you do is look inside the same directory for an implementation of the same name. So it's a little bit misleading when you look at it like this because our interface is form interface, but because there's lots of other things that come after form, the real implementation is right at the top of the Fs, so just there. And as I say, that's just a consequence of the naming just because it's form and form interface. So you can see like a form factory builder and form factory builder interface because the name's so specific, you're going to find mostly that the interface name is next to the class name, which is the provided default implementation of that interface itself. But in this case, as I say, it's just that little bit extra confusing. So we're gonna go into form. Before we look at handle request, I just want to show you that at the top here, form implements form interface. And again, normally you can also do like a search across the vendor directory. So if you went into the vendor directory here and you did a find, and you could say implements form interface like that. So you could try and figure out what classes also implement that interface just by doing a search. But because in this case, the first one is iterator aggregate, it makes doing that kind of search like that bit harder as well. So it's like double tricky to find this first one. Anyway, form interface, as we can see, the thing that we're interested in is handle request. So let's look for our implementation of handle request. So on the form class, just search for handle request. And we can see we've got this public function, which takes our request. And again, just to throw in even more confusion as to what this does, at least we're seeing some code here though. What this does is it calls this config get request handler, then actually calls handle request on that. So it's like that double layer of indirection going on. And whilst that's really nice code to work with, it's actually really complicated code to understand sometimes. So anyway, next tip, this config get request handler is gonna have to return something. So I'm just holding down command there and hovering over it. Probably works the same on Windows and Linux by just holding down control, hover over it and we can see the implementation of this function should return a request handler interface. So let's just try and get to that. Well, it'd be nice if it took me to the interface somehow. Doesn't seem to want to do that. Okay, so next tip. I'm just gonna hit shift twice. And then this is just gonna allow me to search across my entire project for anything called request handler interface. Hit return on that. We can see we've been taken to another interface, obviously by the name request handler interface. And again, this implementation is quite tricky to find. So if again, we start by looking in form and look for anything that's implementing request handler interface. So there's no direct class called request handler.php. So we need to do a little bit more investigative work. So I'm gonna take that interface name and again, search the vendor directory. I'm gonna do a finding path and 
look for anything that implements request handler interface, making sure to actually spell implements properly. And we can see there's two here. So there's HTTP foundation request handler and native request handler. If you're unsure, I'll show you a way to find out which one it might be. But in our case, it's going to be the HTTP foundation request handler. And that's because that's exactly the object that we're working with from our controller. So we've got the actual implementation here and we can see that when handle request is actually called from our contact method, this is the code that really runs. So rather than me just telling you what happens, it's much easier if you look yourself. And I appreciate just from what we've looked at, it can be difficult to find that implementation. That is going to happen regardless of whichever framework that you use. It's just modern programming. So I'm going to put a dump statement in here, not the usual one. I'm just going to use one that I have. Doctrine debug dump is what I call this. It's set up as a shortcut inside PHP Storm. I've got videos on the site on PHP Storm, so do a search and you'll find a load of different tips and tricks. And I'm just going to dump out some text, in fact, and we'll just say, did we get here? Okay, so this is a class that's provided in vendor or third party code. So you can see at the top here, we're in vendor, symphony, blah, 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 HTTP foundation. So when I save this, I'm actually editing third party code, which is not really a good practice, but it does help you figure out what's happening. So yeah, anyway, so let's give it a refresh and we'll just fill in our form. Any old nonsense will do. And then we could see we're getting to the dump statement. Okay, so did we get here? Yes, we're in the right implementation. So if we look back at our form interface, it says inspects the given request and calls the submit function if the form was deemed to be submitted. So let's step through this code and figure out how we get to where we get. So we've got these three checks at the top that say get method, head method, or trace is the method, then do this first block. Well, let's see what our method is. We'll give it a refresh. And we can see that our method is post. So we're basically jumping straight to the else block there. Okay, I'll move this debug statement down. Next up, the wording on this code is quite good. It tells us, has this max post size been exceeded? Well, most likely not. We're not really dealing with attachments, so no worries there. Next, we do some checks around the name. Well, let's dump out the name so that we can see what we're working with here. So again, just refreshing the page, sending that back in. This is our contact form. Why? Well. Let's go back to our contact control and take a look from there. Just jump to our contact type. The contact type extends abstract type. There's a method on abstract type called get block prefix. And this method here will be returning the name contact or lowercase as the name of our form. So if we go back to the form, take a look at the form page source. We can see our form has the name of contact. Okay, bit of trivia for you there. You don't really need to know about that. Let's get back to our request handler. It's hidden it away from me. Okay, so we're in here. We know that this is now contact, so it is set. Checks if the form name is set. And then we should be hitting this block here because the request, request, in other words, the stuff that we've posted in should have that name of contact. Again, let's dump out, pop this maybe onto two lines now to make it a bit easier to read. And so this should return true. So let's fill this back in again, send that in and we're getting a true there. And again, we could just dump off just the request request just to show you what I mean. It's not a super nice output statement really that, but we're getting the fact that there is an array with the key of contact on there. So that's why we're hitting this piece, which means we don't hit that return block. So we're still going here. We're going to check if this is an array. And then what I'm going to do is just dump off the data at this point as well just to show you exactly where we're at. I think I must have still left that debug statement in at the top there. Silly me. Okay, refresh again. So you can see it's an array of all our form data. Again, I'll just remove that out. There's a check here just to make sure that the form doesn't get submitted improperly. And then by now we know that we're going to be calling form submit with that data. And so you know now our form will have been submitted. And so what we can next do is say, if the form is submitted and the next check that we do here is and the form is valid which doesn't really have any bearing at the moment because we're not doing any validation then we can assume inside here that we're in the context of a form submission and i'm going to get rid of that dump statement so if we're in here then 
we can get access to that form data. You can call this anything you want. I'm just going to call it contact form data for sort of explicitness as to what it is. From the form, we just need to call the get data. And in our case, as we've said already, this is going to be an array, but typically when working with a form, you'd probably be working with an entity. So form get the data is usually going to return the instance of the entity that that form relates to. So if it was our contact form and we had, we wanted to save off this contact information to the database, we might have a contact entity and therefore form get data would return a populated instance of that contact entity. Don't worry too much about that at this point. It will all become clearer in time. So let's just dump out the contact form data now, which should, in theory, when we post in our form, show us this out outcome of the form submission. And if we're not posted in anything, then nothing should happen. And we'd also do something interesting here, maybe a redirect or something, or in our case, we're actually going to send off an email. OK, so let's give this a refresh. We shouldn't see anything at the bottom to begin with because this is our get. The form's not been submitted. And then we're going to submit something. And now we do see that. And we're just seeing the output from our form get data call. Now, one really interesting and very nice thing is that our date of birth gets submitted in in the form of text. But if we look at the output, we're actually getting, it won't actually stay on screen for me whilst I move up, but we're actually getting a, a date time instance there. So the, the transformation has happened behind the scenes for us. Now we've covered a lot of information in this video and I appreciate that forms are quite the brain bender. So I would strongly advise that you just play around with those dump statements. Just have a little bit of a play here, try and change stuff up, try and get a little bit of familiarity with it. And in the next video, we'll get on with sending an email.